Hello, everybody, and welcome. I am joined by Simon Hall uh, from the War Games Zone. Uh, Simon, welcome to the show, buddy. Yeah, thank you. Great, great to be here. Uh, well, we've got you on today to actually have a talk about Mortem Ad Glorium, uh, which is an ancient battles game. Uh, now, have I said that right? Because I'm, I'm always a little nervous whenever I dive into historical not, to make sure I've got it right. Not quite, but nearly. Not quite. Uh, the actual real full title would be Ad Mortem Ad Glorium, ah. which is to death and glory in Latin, which was a Roman battle charge. Ah, so the shortened version for the rules is Mortem Et Glorium, so E.T. Glorium. Okay, so, well... Uh, or, or Meg for short, if you want to simplify it for the, for the length of the conversation, it's much easier to call it Meg now. It's known as that around the world already. I'll go with Meg. <laughs> yeah, easier, right? Eh? Yeah, uh, a little bit, just a little bit. All right, so yeah. for, for anyone who's been living under a rock and doesn't know what this game is, what, what would be the, the elevator pitch? What's the idea behind this game? Uh, this is uh, it's an ancient battle game, so it allows you to play out the, the battles of ancient history. Um, it's designed to be a fast and pacey version and a fun version, but at the same time has captured a lot of history very, very well. Mm -hmm. um, so um, the players tell me what they love about it is its pace and fun, but they also love the fact that Romans feel like Romans and Huns feel like Huns and Samurai feel like Samurai, which is not something that's actually that common if you look at a lot of rule sets, having been an ancient player for... 46 years now of my wow. life um, so so in headline terms that's what it is and you can play it in the new companion form that's coming out uh, with relatively small armies in an hour and a half or you can play a version of it with relatively large armies in in about three hours so it's relatively flexible and if you've never played ancients before it's a cracker to have a go at because it's relatively easy to learn and actually you don't need any figures at all because the new book that comes out has got three pre-printed armies so literally you could print those out stick them on some bases and have a go at ancients so if you're a sci-fi player or a world war ii player and have never had a go never been a better chance to have a go at throwing some spears around instead well th this sounds really good because one of the things that i'm always worried about whenever i look at any kind of historical be it from like world war ii going back to like ancients to romans to samurai i'm always worried about where is my jump off point so having those already in the book sounds like a, a really good idea um who are some of the the key factions that you might actually recommend people actually start off with if they're diving into historicals well the the, the three that are in the book are, are, are three absolute classics from history, so you, you've got the um, uh, the late Republican Romans, so basically the army, the army of Caesar. Mm -hmm. You've got the Gauls, which opposed him in the Gallic Wars, and you've got the Parthians, which crushed a Roman army at Carrhae a little bit later. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you can't go very far wrong than starting with those three. The, the nice thing about them in character is they're very, very different. Um, the rules make Romans feel like Romans because the rules have certain characteristics in that bring all the troops to life. Mm -hmm. So the, the Romans have got something called um, impact weapon for their main punchy attack with a, with a pillum, and then they've got something called shield cover, which allows them to protect themselves from arrows. Mm -hmm. um, the Gauls have got something called devastating charge, which is crunchy at first impact, mm -hmm. but the rules separate the first 10 seconds of combat and call it charge combat and the rest and call it melee combat. So they're very good in the first whack, and mm -hmm. then if you hold them, they're not so good afterwards. Mm -hmm. And the Parthians are completely different. They're a missile um, nation with horse archers combined with fully armored cataphracts on horseback. So they're three radically different armies, but from very much the same era. So those three are perfect, actually, to get you going. Awesome. Now, uh, for miniature scale and actually battle size, I was, we were talking a little bit before we actually started here, and you said there's like three levels people can play at during the game? Yeah. Yeah, we've, we've, we've got three versions of the game, which are, which are uh, Latin turned Pacto, Magna, and Maximus. So Pacto means compact. Mm -hmm. Maximus, you can imagine, it's uh, the big one, uh, and, and Magna uh, in the middle is called Magna because it's big, because it's designed for big figures. Mm -hmm. So what we've tried to do with this, and I've, I, my primary objective of doing rules always has been to promote the hobby. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to allow people to get into the hobby very, very easily. So the Pacto version uh, is a relatively small purchase, even if you do it in figures. Uh, we, we, we fight the battles with bases. The bases have got two, three or four figures on. Um, and those are formed into units, and you can play a Pacto game with as little as 20 bases. Oh. So it's a relatively small job to buy and build one of those. If you get it up to the maximum size of game, which is played on a table four times the size, um, you end up having something more between 70 and 90 bases, depending on the army. Mm -hmm. So what I've tried to do with the rules, as, as well as make a great set of rules, is, is give people a chance to get going. So you can get going for nothing. 
all you need is a three, three foot by two foot space and the pack to armies in the book. And then a relatively modest investment and the amount of time can build you and paint your pack to army. Those can be done in a matter of a few weeks. And then you can progress to Magna and can finish up with the Maximus game, which is the one we all play at the big competitions like the World Championship we had last year. Well, I mean, the, the game is not new. It's been out there for, for quite a while. I mean, you were, you were talking that there's quite a large fan base for this already out there in the world. There is, yeah. We've, um, what happened with the rules is I came up with a, a, a novel idea, and we'll come back to this. The whole game system is driven by colours. Uh, so it's quite unique, actually. And I came up with that about five years ago. And I decided it was well worth me producing to just see whether it caught on and see how much people liked it. So I, I self-published it back in 2016 um, in a sort of cottage industry fashion. It wasn't even a book. It was a very nice folder. It was a good production. It was a nice folder with, uh, with inserts. And it's got some custom dice and some cards. Um, and I printed out 1,200 copies. Um, and it very, very quickly caught on. So a lot of people really liked it. So it's got a fan base around the world. I've sent sets to all sorts of places. They've gone to Chile, Hawaii, um, and I think I've got about 40 left in total <laughs> wow. of that original set. So, um, so that was a great exercise. And, and what it allowed me to do was to perfect the rules because what's been really lovely is we've ended up with a fantastic community feel. So out of those 1,200 players, I've probably got 300 who've been very, very active in making suggestions and tweaks and adaptions. Mm -hmm. So we've sort of perfected the whole thing and the point system over those three years. And we've got an amazing team of people on the history side because we, we now have 650 army lists, slightly more than, mm -hmm. um, for the different armies of ancient history all the way from 2000 BCE all the way up to about 1550. Um, and all of those actually sit online on the Mortal Glorian website totally free. Oh, wow. So you've got an incredible database and, and the people involved in it in that are fantastic. So we, we've had some fantastic involvement. So it's actually, after I launched it, caught on and become a real community effort. So probably after three years, even done that way, it's probably the maybe the third or fourth most played ancient rule set on the planet, I, I would suspect. It won't, Hail Caesar will be the biggest by a mile. Mm. Um, and on Facebook polls recently, it's actually come out first in terms of people's favorite rule set. So um, I'm thrilled to bits with that. And now, of course, doing it with PSC, the book's going to look magnificent. Mm. And it's got these three different versions in and the pre-printed um, armies. Um, it's a very, very lovely package. So I'm thrilled to bits. In fact, I was just signing it off yesterday. It's, it's off of the printers. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Well, that, that actually brings us to an important point. So you've done the original and now you've, you've teamed up with the guys at PSC Games to actually bring it back to the market. The big mm. question that I'm sure is on everybody's mind is when, where and how do I lay my hands on this? Well, the launch day is May the 2nd, so not long to wait now. Um, despite the, the virus, we've managed to keep everything going. We made a very early decision to pull all the production back to the UK, which has proved a, a godsend in terms mm -hmm. of timing. So um, everybody, everything's on schedule to be, uh, to be launched then, and it will go on sale on the PSC website and on my website mm -hmm. on that day. Uh, we've got a big launch event that day. I'm doing three webinars with uh, Dr. Simon Elliott, who's written the foreword, who's a, a well-known historian who specializes in Rome, mm -hmm. um, who loves the rules and says they're the only rules he's ever played that makes Romans feel like Romans. Mm. Well, so it's... we are actually doing a bunch of webinars that people can sign up to, mm -hmm. register and join. And actually what we're going to do is we're going to fight two famous Roman battles. He's going to fight one in Kent, where he lives, and I'm going to fight one in Cape Town, down where I now live. And the webinars are set up to be at the beginning, the middle, and the end of those battles. So people can join in at the beginning for an overview of the rules. They can join in the middle and see a bit what's going on, and they can join at the end and see what's happened in the two games. That's, so that's we've got cool. a lovely big launch event on, on those days. And in addition uh, to the rules, uh, we've also got a whole load of figures coming out. Uh, there are Mortimer McGlorian figures, and that is also well worth talking about. Um, it's a very interesting technology that Will introduced me to. It's a different type of plastic. It sits in between what we would know as old soft plastic and hard plastic. Mm -hmm. And it takes paint incredibly well. And the figures have some flex in them so they don't break. And speaking from the heart, it's the first time actually that I've found plastic figures better than metal ones. And well, they're really, really interesting. They're, they're, somehow the plastic flows beautifully, so the detail is even better than metal. So we've taken my Lurkio Masters mm -hmm. for several armies and run them through that system and are producing 
absolutely fabulous um, plastic figures to go with the rules. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if anybody doesn't know Lurkio, uh, would you mind maybe just giving us a little bit of a, a rundown on what yeah. you do there? Lurkio is a, a, a niche uh, producer of 50 millimeter metal figures. Mm -hmm. um, it was started by a friend of mine, Simon Clark. It became a bit much for him to, to follow up with, so I, I picked it up and I've carried it on. Um, we, we focus on now trying to get really top-end sculpts for the figures, so we've just launched some late Romans, which are spectacular, really lovely. Mm. Um, so it's a, it's a small little niche business. You can find it at www.lurkio.co.uk, mm -hmm. but the, uh, the figures um, get very fine comments, from again, from players and collectors all over the world. Mm. And we've got about 24, I think, ranges in total at this current time. It's, so, it's, yeah. it's one of those things I love about historical models whenever they're done right is if you know someone has a passion for it they're going to go in, they're going to do the research, they're going to find all the, the tiny little details that just make it look right, look, make it look like it yeah. would have. It, it, it does make a difference and we find some very good sculptors. So these Romans for instance we've done some of the first, for the first time we've done multi-poses, they're packs of 24 uh, figures mm -hmm. and in that you've got I think 12 different poses each time so there's a huge variety in there mm -hmm. and we we put in people throwing the plumbata throwing the actual darts that they threw in mm -hmm. different ways which is a model that doesn't generally exist and some different different poses that people have never done before so yeah they, they look absolutely fabulous so uh, very very pleased with them and in plastics they just came out so perfectly and of course the plastics are probably 40 percent the the price of the metals mm -hmm. so if you want to collect an army in future doing it in plastics one box of those plastics, mm. I think they're generally um, <clears throat> 30 or 35 pounds for the box sets. One box of those will get you a pack to army. You're up and running. All you need is some bases to stick them on and you've got your army. Very Fantastic. Cool. Very cool. Now, uh, one of the other important things about a game like this is, of course, the gaming table. Would you have any recommendations for folks at home whenever they're actually maybe setting up their first Ancients battle table? Yeah, if you're, if you're playing the small game, in 15 millimeter the table size is only three feet by two feet so you can play that on an everyday dining table um, and most ancient battles actually unlike world war ii or later there wasn't a huge amount of terrain there's a terrain system in there to develop the terrain so probably if you're just playing your first game pick a hill pick a piece of sort of roughish going and pick a little wood stick those three down and then roll the dice for who plays from which side and don't make it any more complicated than that mm -hmm. um, and if you're playing a, the full size game with the 80 pieces the table's a six by four foot table the same principles apply mm -hmm. and then later as you get to know the rules you'll find there's a very interesting section in the rules quite novel called the pre-battle system and the pre-battle system is actually a way of representing what happened in the five days before a battle Ooh. So if you read through history, and I'm sure you, you, you found the same, battles are not all won and lost on the day of the battle. Mm. They're often won and lost in the days before the battle by a great general manoeuvring into terrain of their advantage. Mm -hmm. Well, Wellington retiring to Waterloo, which he'd seen nine months earlier, I think, if I remember rightly. Mm -hmm. So this, this system very quickly has a little game within a game which takes all of ten minutes, which plays out the five days before the battle and figures out where it's fought, and that determines the terrain for the game. Which see, is a which is a new novel thing that the players really like. See, that's that's so something I really to love. Do that. Yeah, I, I I love the idea that the the armies aren't just you know snapped into existence. Oh, we're lined up. Oh, we're ready to go. Let's have a fight. Any time, whenever a game can actually say, no, 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 the 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 army is alive. It's moving. It's it's finding where it wants to fight. You know, there are scouts outranging. There's supplies coming in. You know, that's exactly that's exactly. what you really want to see in a game like this. Exactly, and, and, and the trick we've managed to do with it is get enough of that in, because most games have none of it in in Ancients, mm -hmm. to get enough of it in, but do it quickly. Mm -hmm. So it's a neat system. So in 10 minutes, you've, you've said to yourself, right, I've set my arm. I'll give you a narrative. It's like I've got a Gallic army. It's got lots of loose order troops. It wants to fight in the woods. I set my army out, and it's, it's in an area that's got very dense terrain, it's, it, and it's smack up against some mountains. Mm -hmm. So that's perfect. And then we play some, some of the colours against each other, and the opposing player with a better general will be possibly trying to pull me out of there. Mm -hmm. So over time, I will move. And then maybe on day two, I managed to hold on. Day three, I hold on. But day four, he drags me out away from the heavily wooded area into a light wooded area. Mm -hmm. And day, day five, I'm dragged out into a, 
a non-wooded area and that's where the battle occurs mm. and the narrative for that is i've gone i've had to go foraging i've had to go find food and caesar being clever has caught me while i'm not around the trees anymore mm -hmm. and then i'll fight the battle in that type of terrain mm -hmm. and then the scouting is almost instantly done another way so you have that as well so there is a chance you would see the entirety of the opposing army and how it's deployed before you have to deploy your troops or decide whether you want to do some sweeping development with flank marches or such things. So this little thing at the beginning, which is 10 or 15 minutes, brings all of that to life in a really quick way. Mm -hmm. And then this, this style of game, you know, an ancient battle game is very different to something like a sci-fi game where it is small units of people skirmishing. This is the the grand layout of a force you know you've got your cavalry on the flanks you've got your artillery in the back you've got your archers you've got your mainline infantry Indeed. playing something like Indeed. that out i'm sure is a very very different feel to what most people will be used to who are playing sci-fi games uh, it would. I mean, I, I've, I've played plenty of skirmish games mm. um, and indeed have designed a crossover game which will come out probably later this year, mm. with, which is sort of sci-fi historical. So, uh, and those tend to operate, as you say, with little groups of so, sort of skirmish squads, if you like, operating as individuals. In this, you, you start as Alexander the Great and you look down at your army and underneath you in your army are your three or four senior generals and they're going to command the centre, the wings, the reserves. Mm -hmm. And under them, are the junior generals and they'll typically be, be 10 and 15 in an army and they command big blocks of troops so mm -hmm. one of them in the center might have a, a third of the phalanx and that might be 3,000 warriors in one block and the whole army is representing 20 30 40 thousand people mm -hmm. sometimes much more than that so you play it out as in the game with these fairly chunky blocks which were the main what we term tactical unit groups or skirmishing unit groups that you would see from the position of Alexander the Great. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't see a unit, in fact, a, a, a unit as it's known in the, in the phalanx is 256 men. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't see anything that small. You, you, you'd see a couple of thousand very long pointy sticks sticking up in the air where one of your <laughs> big blocks of phalanxes and one of your generals is leading them. Yeah. So the battle has to feel like that. Mm -hmm. But the armies vary enormously. So if you're playing something that's like a Mongol army, it will end up having loads of fast moving skirmishes and instead of feeling sort of stodgy, slow and, and cumbersome and heavy, it will feel extremely agile in this. And in fact, you'll be able to flow those light, light cavalry around the wings of armies or faint forward and retire and run away before you can get caught. And all those different tactics of history that are very real, mm. they, they all tend to come to life in the game. Yeah, there, there's something I'm wondering about as well is how do you manage casualties within the game? Because sometimes in an Ancients battle, it's not that a guy is dead or dying, it's that the unit is no longer combat effective. How do you, you deal with that with Meg? Yeah, we, we, we treat the cohesion loss in a very simple way, but it works very effectively. We, we, have, we have a set of bases, so if you can imagine two blocks of figures that are each four wide and two deep as bases, with eight bases against eight bases. Mm -hmm. the, the game system fights by file, so you'll roll four dice against each other. And these, the coloured dice that we use, which you come back to, tell you the result instantly when you roll them. Mm -hmm. And the results are either you take a whole base off, mm -hmm. you, you credit yourself half a base, if you like, and the next time you get a half base, you take an enemy base off, mm -hmm. or you do a special effect with an S, or you do nothing. Mm -hmm. So the whole attritional effect in the game is done by removing bases. Mm -hmm. And that, that's actually rather nice because it gives you the sense of things gradually slowly collapsing because as they deteriorate, their, their capability of fighting drops because they have less files and less bases and it, it all works quite nicely. Um, and then, it, then once those drop to below half strength, they're broken. Mm -hmm. And an army's made up of a bunch of those. And once the army loses half of those, the army is broken. So it, it's actually a relatively simple concept. Mm -hmm. isn't it? There's nothing fancy about it, but it works extremely effectively because of how it interacts with the other other mechanisms in the rules. Awesome, awesome. Well, I mean, like it's it's one of those things I've been told by designer after designer is whenever you're building a game, you don't need to throw the kitchen sink at it. Build it till it works. Well, yeah, absolutely. The big breakthrough for me in this, which was very interesting, is it's a it's a it's a system mm -hmm. um, using colours. So I, I had this idea that. Uh, wouldn't it be nice because it makes it very easy rather than having tables and numbers too much that so we use five colors that we all recognize so i've got we've got red yellow green white black mm -hmm. so i set a system up where you have cards or chits you can use either and the colors on those uh, are used to maneuver your troops to make actions and the red is always the best mm -hmm. and the black is the worst uh -huh. so then then you move from that that generals who better generals get more of the chits mm -hmm. 
worse channels get less of the chips. So what you're doing is you're looking at what chips you've got and you're deciding, well, over the red, I can do something fairly complicated with those drill legionaries. And with my two whites, I can walk directly ahead. And these two black ones, I've got to no use at all, etc. So you're planning what you can do with the colors. Mm -hmm. It mirrors it with a set of dice that, that go red down to black with the three symbols of a skull, mm -hmm. a sword, an arrow, an S, and a blank on it. And again, the red one is the best and the black one is the worst. Mm -hmm. And what's nice is once you know a few factors, you very quickly work out which dice you need to roll and you can read the results straight off the dice. Mm -hmm. So there's no thinking needed, really. Yeah. So the, the idea of the concept was to make it fun because it comes alive with the colors, but also to take 80% of your brain power away from the outcomes. Mm -hmm. So that your brain power is focused on making the decisions as a general of what you do. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of rule sets I played in the when I was growing up, particularly, and we, we used to love our tables of numbers and calculations. And, but actually, if you think about it, you're using 80% of your brain power to work out the outcome. Yeah, well, it's it's... really how it should work. It's reading a small language rather than trying to do maths is the way I always describe it. That's a good way of looking at it. So once you've learned the language of the colors, which is quite easy to learn, mm -hmm. it's super quick to, to actually work out what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, and once people know their armies, you very quickly know, oh, against those, I'm a yellow against a white in charge combat. Mm -hmm. And that white me has got no skulls on it. That's not a very good dice. You can't really hurt me badly. Mm -hmm. But the yellow one has got a skull on it and has yeah. got a, more of the wounds on it so I can do more damage to you. Yeah, so, it so once you get that narrative in thing. your head, mm -hmm. you're very quickly trying to make sure the opposing people are always throwing white or black dice and you're yeah. all, always throwing coloured ones. And yeah. it's, it's, well, uh, it brings it to life. Well, Simon, Plus the fun of rolling dice with skulls on is always fun. Of course, of course. Well, Simon, yeah. it, it sounds like it's going to be a really fun game and people should definitely go and check it out. Are there any other points that you would really like to let people know about or is there anything about the game that we've possibly missed? Um, I think we've got the headlines. I think that the... the there are a few things that, to add. One is the community has become absolutely fantastic. So we've got a great online forum. We've got great Facebook pages. And the players are an incredibly friendly bunch. Mm -hmm. So if you want to get started playing Meg anywhere in the world, join one of those and put a message up and you will get help. Mm -hmm. You'll get help very quickly. Yeah. There are a bunch of videos online from me as well, which, which will teach you how to play. So um, the rule book actually is that people say is a relatively easy read. But no rule book is truly an easy read. So actually watching somebody give you a demo is often much better. So you can find all you need online to actually uh, do that. And all the events we have are great fun. We, we, I think this year scheduled, we had 18 tournament events in the UK scheduled, even though it's not been fully published, yet, mm -hmm. even in its original form. Um, and we had the World Championship with 42 players in, uh, in Daventry mm -hmm. in the middle of last year. These events are actually really quite lighthearted and good fun. Mm -hmm. We've actually had two people come to a major competition never having played the game at all. Ah. Actually. They I turned like up the on the day having like read the rules but never that. played mm -hmm. with an army. Um, and one of us who knew the game well played them in the first game. Mm -hmm. And they uh, got help in the second and third game from people. And by the time they finished the weekend, they were very happy standing alone and playing themselves, awesome. which I think is remarkable and, 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 awesome. and a quite lovely thing. Um, and then all the history. If you if you like anything about ancient history, go on the website. You will find the army. There's 650 there. There's no question it'll be there. <laughs> and one of the great things about the rules is we've kept the point system online. It's not wedded to a book. Mm -hmm. And we have optimized it and optimized it and optimized it. Mm -hmm. So actually, there's no killer army in this at all. Uh, no death all the armies, All the armies can be played and, and successful. All 650. You can give me any one of them, I'm sure I could do okay with it. Nice. Uh, and the great thing about that is you just choose what you like. Mm -hmm. you know, if, you, if you really love Alexander the Great's history, get his army. Yeah. If, if you really like Boudicca, play hers. If you like Japanese history, go get some samurai. Mm -hmm. They'll all work and they'll all work really well and they will all feel very historical as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, really I would recommend to people it's a great set of rules to try if you like history, because just pick your favorite and I'll guarantee it'll be great fun. Awesome. Awesome. And the only, the only other things I would add is the, um, if I may, is the core system, the color system is very adaptable. So what I found I can do is I can adapt the same principles to every period of history. Mm -hmm. So my overall vision for this is to have a suite of rules for all the different periods. So somebody like me, I'm, I'm sitting in a room here with probably about 50,000 50 millimeter figures. Mm -hmm probably 5,000 28 millimeter ones, certainly 50,000 six mil ones and about 8,000 tanks. Yeah. <laughs> total. 
So, you know, I've done that over many years, but I change around the periods. Mm -hmm. One of the difficulties is if you want to play six periods of history and have to learn six completely different rule sets, it's pretty yeah. difficult. Yeah. But the nice thing about this is if we have a common core, flitting from ancients to Napoleonics to World War II isn't actually that hard. Yeah. So, the, so the vision over the next two years with PSC is we're going to bring out rule sets in uh, in total. We'll have the Meg one for ancients. Mm -hmm. The next one will probably be called will be Divisions of Steel, which is a World War II one. Mm -hmm. The next one after that is probably Invasion Earth, which I alluded to earlier, which is a crossover sci-fi um, uh, colonial game. Yeah. It's based around the War of the Worlds era with Martians, and uh, there's a whole narrative to go with it. But it, it's a skirmish version of using this system. Mm -hmm. uh, Renaissance of Glory, and I'll show you Glory, which is the Renaissance version, English Civil War and the, th and the Thirty uh, Years' War. Uh, and then uh, uh, tweaks for the Seven Years' War. Uh, and the American Civil War and the whole lot. So basically the idea I have is that there's a set of rules that uses color system, which we mm -hmm. call the, the uh, color command and control system, triple C system, mm -hmm. that have all got that at its heart. So it's a little bit like Intel inside. You can have different computers and they've got, they work in slightly different ways, but they've got a common core. And mm -hmm. by having a common core, um, you know it works well and you can adapt pretty quickly from one to another. So wow. that's the big vision, which is going to take a couple of years to achieve. Mm -hmm. um, but the World War II and the Napoleonic and the Renaissance are all nearly ready. Awesome. Well, they're all playing well. So, so what's I'll get space? to talk to you a lot more about these things as we move forward with that and figure ranges and, and such things. And Definitely. see if we can get some of you people who love sci-fi games or fantasy games to have a crack at some of the historical games. Mm. I, I'm, I'm not going to lie. After, after hearing about it, talking to you about it, I am, I'm quite tempted. All right. Well, uh, Simon, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, everybody, I'll tell you what, uh, get your comments in below if you have any thoughts, any questions, uh, just drop them in the comments section. I'm sure Simon here will probably have a little bit of a peek at them and, uh, you know, you might get a comment back. Uh, Simon, once again, thank you. Everybody, we'll I'd move be on. Delighted. I'd be delighted to answer any comments. Not a problem at all. And uh, thanks for inviting me on. Look forward to the next time. All right, awesome. Everybody, we'll move on. We'll see you again soon. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.